Hi and welcome to this week's episode of the Property Doctor Podcast with me, your host, Dr. Andrew Threadgold. This week I thought I'd do a solo podcast and a little bit of kind of property education, if you like, a discussion about buy to lets, the foundation, the bottom rung of the property strategy triangle, if you like, at the bottom of the pyramid, as a subject that most people hear about know about the general public knows quite a lot about it but many people tend not to truly understand buy to lets they may have some misconceptions about buy to lets and also most people when they see the returns that you can get from buy to lets particularly at the moment in the current interest rate environment a lot of people want to move on to bigger sexier strategies ourselves included but at the minute we're looking at even more kind of buy to let stuff despite the bigger stuff that we've got going on for very good reasons and I'll try and come on to that um, as we move forward so what I, what I mean by the returns of buy to let I mean your typical a few years ago your typical buy to let you would probably so I'll take Darlington as a as an example it's a very well known area in the northeast of England there's a lot of work going on in Darlington and a lot of investment in the area by the treasury and the typical value of a buy to let house in Darlington would be around about 75 to 120,000 something something like that and your typical rent would be this is a few years ago your typical rent would be about 500 550 pounds your typical mortgage would be 200 ish um, and your costs all in, you'd be about £200, £250 pounds a month. So your buy-to-let is getting you about £300 pounds a month, and that, that was kind of a typical return per buy-to-let. Um, and it doesn't take people long, because in today's world, people want to, you know, want to be successful yesterday. They don't want to wait the, uh, they don't. Most people get sold these dreams that they don't want to have to wait more than seven days to get financial freedom. And when you start realising that a buy to let will get you a couple of three hundred quid, that's not exactly financial freedom, and you'll need an awful lot of them. Um, and at the begin, the beginning, there's an awful lot of time and effort that goes into getting your buy to let kind of processes right. Um, so a lot of people move away from buy to lets early doors. Now there's a there's a property strategy for everybody. Um, in my particular case, we needed to. My, our goal was to replace our income from our day jobs, and as a doctor, that's not a bad income. So you need a lot of buy to lets to do that. And when we were on a timeline, because we had a specific goal to do it by a certain time. We needed to change strategy, but now we've kind of got there, we understand that there are a lot of benefits to buy to lets, and that's why we're actively looking backwards. Um, because as we'll come on to, there's quite a bit of buy to lets is actually long term wealth and you know, low barrier to entry and all that stuff. So, we'll come on to why buy to lets, we'll come on to what a typical buy to let looks like. Um, we'll talk about the negatives I've already highlighted one or two we'll talk about the positives um, and we'll talk about the general environment for buy to lets at the minute and this this is where the, the trouble is really because back then you would get your 300 250 300 pounds a month for your buy to let nowadays because the interest rates are higher the mortgage payments are higher but also the rent payments are higher at the minute too and I don't think rents will come down. I think it's probably more upside to rents to come. So when you've got higher mortgage rates, higher rents, the margin men, remains the same. In a lot of people's kind of experience, relatively recently, before the rents took off or before they put the rents up, their mortgage rates were going up, their rents were staying the same, and that margin was getting squeezed. And when you've got buy-to-lets that are only making you 50 25 pounds a month and it takes one person not to pay their rent for a few months or need evicting or trash the property that can wipe the full year's income out from a portfolio of buy to lets so 
you know, there's a lot of negatives to buy to lets and a lot of people have took their eye off them because of that. However, base rate has remained the same for the second time on the bounce. The inflation seems to be coming down slowly. And the the swap rates, which are what mortgage rates are based on, look like they're the best kind of indicator for what's going to happen and that they are predicting that mortgage rates are coming down too. So over the next few years, mortgage rates will come down, rents will remain high and that margin will come back again. Um, and if you've bought in the right places at the right price, you, you should, if you buy at this moment in time, there's definitely a window of opportunity there for people to actually get good stock that could set them up for the future. But you've got to deploy capital into it now rather than having to wait and do other stuff. So if you've got the money or you've got a long-term view, then buy to let's definitely still have an excellent place in any successful property person's portfolio. So the thing with buy to lets is that they'll never go out of fashion. There will always be a need for them. There's, um, there's literally millions of people on waiting lists to get into housing. So but with buy to lets aren't necessarily kind of social housing, but they do serve a purpose and you're putting normal people into normal houses in normal places. Um, I grew up in a council house. You know, it was uh, a council-owned council house that I grew up in for a long part of my childhood. Um, I think back in the day, Maggie was selling the council houses off, but I'm not sure what happened with ours. But anyway, that's the difference at Kettle Fish. Um, um, well, because she sold them off, actually, there's a, a lot of good buy-to-let stock should be ex-council properties because those are in the areas that people want to live and need to live. But that's another thing. We'll come back to that. Um, the other thing is that people, normal people, struggle to save deposits. So if they struggle to save deposits, they will struggle to buy houses. And if they struggle to buy houses, they need somewhere to rent. So there's always going to be a demand. Further evidence of a demand the government's house building targets have not been met, I don't think, since I've been alive. I think last every year it's something like 300,000 new homes that they're supposed to build and they miss it by over 100,000 every single year. So we've got a, an inc increasing population, a decreasing amount of supply, all trying to squeeze into the available stock that they've got. So that's another reason why I think there's probably a little bit more headroom to go in rents, but also why buy to let is, is a safe strategy, safe and sound. The other thing is if, when you try and move into things like HMOs or service accommodation or um, commercial conversions or land developments and things like that, the risk is much higher. The cost of entry is much, much higher. And then the risk and the swings that you can get in terms of your cash flow is is a great deal larger as well so when you're coming into buy to lets typically you need smaller amounts of money the returns might be less but they're more predictable and if you get a down valuation on a buy to let property of 10 percent you might be losing 10 grand whereas if you've got and that that's coming off kind of the loan to value for when you do your revi refinance. Whereas if you've got a property that you've spent 300 grand doing up, it, you think it's worth 500 and then all of a sudden you get a down valuation of 50 grand, then that is a big chunk of money that you're having to leave in the property. So the, the, the actual capital risk in each buy to let property is much less because your typical buy to let should be 75 to 120 grand there or thereabouts, especially if you're operating in the north of England. So it's, it's a low risk strategy relatively, low barrier to entry. Um, and the other thing with it is that whilst there is kind of high demand for it, the standards don't need to be five-star hotel type standards. Now, we do our, all our properties, including the buy-to-lets, to a standard that we would be happy living in ourselves, and that's our minimum standard. Um, our luxury service accommodation standards are better than the house we live in. Um, so 
you know, we wouldn't ever produce a property that we wouldn't want to live in ourselves. So if that is kind of a good rule of thumb for what is a kind of your basic standard, then that, that, that should be a reasonable guide for the standard you need to do it to. There are a lot of landlords who get it incredibly kind of seamlessly and streamlined and they've got a cookie cutter approach to doing stuff where they get the same kitchen in the same color in the same shop in every single unit that they do the tradesmen know what they're fitting they know at what time during the schedule of works they're putting the kitchens in the bathrooms are all the same the paintwork's all the same and they're all done to a same standard um and to be honest, that's probably the best way to do it, as long as the standard is good. There are one or two landlords out there that give the rest of us a bad name. Uh, you'll see them on the news all the time that don't look like they care about their properties as long as the rent's being paid. Um, now, I'm not a fan of those landlords. I much prefer to have good quality properties. And the biggest tip that I can give you is if you're going to do a refurb on a property, is do it properly. Because the last thing you want is to do a refurb and then have a problem in the property and have to go back to it at a later date. The more you, more time and effort you spend at the beginning on doing your property well, the longer it takes until you need to go and solve the problem. And that pays you back in dividends. Um, so there we go. So that's just a little bit about why buy to lets and why... Um, you know why it will always be a good strategy so kind of moving on from that what is a typical buy to let i think well i've already mentioned there uh, that they um they should be kind of in areas that people want to live in now in every area in the country there are some very rough places there are some ultra expensive places for that area and then there's the stuff in the middle now there is a market for the very rough places and some people do that and that's their market and that's fair play to them the market that we like is kind of the six or seven out of ten type areas um typically x council um x council three bed semis uh three bed terrace that kind of thing good quality stock where normal people live near schools near bus routes um near shops you know where normal people live with kids Good links, good transport, good schools, nearby to everything, including shops, where people, where normal people live and bring their bring their kids up. Kind of similar to where I grew up, really, and that's that's what I think of when I think of a typical buy to let property. Ideally, if you want a return on your investment, a, a decent yield, as we as we say, then it should be in areas where your properties are between. 75 and 120,000 um you might squeeze something from about 150 grand if you find the, the right spot at the right rent um but the higher you go in terms of value the higher it is to get into it in terms of getting into the strategy so you're better off having a number of units at 60 grand than you are one unit at 120 in my opinion so just moving on a little bit again. So I said at the start, we'd talk about positives and negatives. So I'll start with the negatives of buy to lets. Really, there's not a massive amount of negatives. I mean, the first one is that compared to other property strategies, the cash flow is smaller. So we've already said that. So if you're two, three hundred pounds per property, if you've got a HMO, you might be making fifteen hundred two grand per property if you do it well but to get into that you might need an eight bed hmo which is on a massive end terrace property it might cost you 200 grand to refurb it if you run out of money or the tradesmen disappear then all of a sudden you've got nobody to finish it you've got finance that you still need to pay for and the property isn't performing and if the property is not performing it's a liability and we want assets not liabilities so cost of entry is small with buy to let but equally cash flow is small that goes with it because it's all about risk low risk low reward and that's just the way of the world unfortunately the other thing with buy to lets is because you get a small amount of money per unit you need a lot of them to generate cash flow 
So if you want, I don't know, two and a half thousand pounds a month income, net income, then you're going to need about 10 by to lets. And that takes a long time to do, and it's quite a lot of effort to do it. However, once you've done a few, it gets quicker, gets easier, um, and you can then kind of create your model and cookie cutter that model onto all your subsequent properties. Your properties will also have a lower value. So if you're getting 60, 70,000 pound houses, then even if you've got 10 of them, your your property portfolio value will be six to seven hundred pounds, uh, six to seven hundred thousand pounds. So it's not a sexy thing if you've got ten eight bed HMOs that are doing two grand a month each. That's twenty grand a month. You know your portfolio value might be a couple of million, but it takes effort, risk, and all the rest of it to build up there. And I can't stress enough just how the risk really needs considering properly before you venture into it because it doesn't take much especially if you don't have experience it really doesn't take much to uh to wipe you out and lots of people do and the other thing with buy to let's is it's not cool is it you know let's be honest if uh if you said to someone i've got a portfolio of four or five super luxury high-end apartments in london that people rent out on a nightly basis to be, you know, down the pub, your mates would be impressed, wouldn't they? But if you said, I've got 50 buy to lets in, I don't know, Chelmsford, they'd probably not be as uh, as impressed. So buy to lets have never been cool, but they're, um, there's a lot to be said for them, which brings me on to the positives. So simple things, low risk. I can't tell you how appealing low risk sounds to me at the moment. So the low risk to get into, you need low capital to get into them. So a lower barrier of entry. The If something goes wrong, it won't wipe you out or it shouldn't do because the the capital you're putting into it isn't as high as if you're doing something bigger. So you've got a bigger margin for error. When there's a a change in the market say say you you only do buy to lets and that's your only strategy i spoke to someone last week who's got about 100 buy to lets in the northeast and he's got got it down to a fine art now if the market moves 10 percent, he gets 10 percent on 100 properties and if they're all 100 grand you know what i mean it, it's another 100 grand onto his portfolio so there's a lot to be um a lot to be said for spreading your risk like that they're also a long-term wealth builder. So over the years, as we know, the chances are property does increase in value. Probably not at the rate it used to, but it definitely does increase in value over time. And if you've got 10 buy to lets in 20 years, they may well have doubled in value. Um, whereas if you could only do two or three of a different strategy, Whilst that might have doubled in value, it's probably not going to give you the same cash back as if you've got 10 smaller units. Um, Something that most people forget about is when you do sexier stuff, it's harder to get mortgages and lending on those properties. You you might need a hybrid commercial commercial product, which might be a commercial mortgage with a residential element to it, or it might be a residential mortgage with a higher interest rate, and there might be all sorts of different restrictions and requirements that the lenders want before they'll accept it, and various ways of valuing might be different. With buy-to-lets, you know where you are. You're going to get a simple buy-to-let product, usually the lowest interest rate of all mortgage products, from a kind of limited company standpoint compared to commercial products for certain the um the rent coverage ratio is usually less so if if you've got a, a mortgage um and the mortgage payment's going to be 300 quid a month the bank will want to know that depending on whether you take a two year or a five year fix they will want to know that the rent you get is going to be 125% of the mortgage payment so it's to limit their risk during the, the lettuce or the cabbage kind of um, budget. Liz Truss 
after her, shortly after her budget, they put rent coverage ratios up massively. So most buy to let properties didn't even stack because even if you were getting five hundred pounds a month and the mortgage was three hundred, that two hundred wasn't enough to satisfy the bank that there was enough margin that if anything went wrong you could cover your mortgage costs so they wouldn't lend. Um, and that kind of stuff can impact other strategies too. Whereas typically, that was a very extreme example of what happened, but typically buy-to-lets are good, safe, easy-to-finance products. Now, another thing there is if you retain your individual properties on buy-to-let mortgages, there usually isn't or there isn't a loan-to-value covenant. Whereas if you've got kind of you know, properties with commercial pro- mortgage products on them, there is a loan-to-value covenant. And what does that mean? Well, if the markets... You've got, say you've got a £100,000 buy-to-let property, the market moves 20%. I mean, that that would be a big correction. It's not going to happen, I don't think. But if the market moves 20% and your house is now worth £80,000, but you've got a £75,000 mortgage, because it was 75% loan to value on the hundred grand, then the bank won't recall your loan as long as the rent covers your, covers your mortgage payments. They're not bothered. However, if you've got a fancy serviced accommodation with a commercial valuation on it, that's for the sake of argument of a hundred thousand you bought seventy five grand on it the house is now worth eighty thousand. The bank will want their money back by the end of the week because you've breached their loan to value. They don't want the money you owe to be any less than a certain percentage so if 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 you've got seventy five percent of a hundred thousand pounds and all of a sudden your the house value is 80,000 that means 75,000 is still owed but the property is only worth 80 so your loan to value has suddenly gone from 75% to 90 something percent you've breached their loan to value covenant which gives them the right to recall their loan and they can do it like that so all of a sudden you might have a few properties of commercial mortgages your loan to value covenant gets breached by a swing in the market And you've got to find whatever your portfolio value is and pay by the end of the week. Or they call in the administrators. And it does happen. Um, So somebody that I know had something very similar during the last financial downturn and he needed to find four million quid by the end of the week. But that's for a different episode. Um, I'm not sure if that's a negative or a positive. It should be a positive, that, because that's one of the reasons buy to lets are good because they don't have loan to value covenants on them once you're on the product um other thing about buy to lets there will always be a market for them another so another positive is you could always sell them always that kind of house is in demand so you might have to take a small loss on it hopefully you've held it long enough that you've you're getting a nice win on it but if you need to exit that kind of property you can always sell it and that cannot be said for things like bespoke sui generis HMOs or amazing service accommodation units, you know, tailored to a specific market. So you've got to be careful what you're doing, but that's a definitely a positive for buy to lets. And the quite, you know, the other thing is, if you get the right tenants in the right places and the product you, su- you supply, you produce, is is good you get a low turnover of tenants most people are happy in their homes they're quite happy to live there long term if you look after them they'll look after you um so if you understand your market there's a lot to be said for for the good old buy to let so where do you find these buy to lets from well typically in my experience making contacts with local agents telling them exactly what you want I want this type of property in this location or this postcode with this number of bedrooms at this price. So give the estate agent a shopping list. Um, Once you've done business with them once, they will know that you transact and they will more often than not bring you stuff. And the more you do, the more that you will get to the top of their list. Don't go taking in big boxes of 
quality street that's just cringeworthy they, they know what training course you've been on if you do that so just be nice to them in general pay their fees transact with them regularly build a relationship and they will start bringing you stuff it's that's the way it works don't mess them about because if you start messing people about you that's the reputation you get for yourself so if you're going to do something work your numbers out say you know this is the way i do stuff these are my numbers if it doesn't work for the vendor that's fine but if it does i will buy it and then follow through and complete your transaction and then once you've got a track record that's it that's how it works there's obviously right move you know there's a lot of stuff on right move at the minute it's a it's a kind of a neutral market sellers are more realistic um so buyers can kind of snick decent deals word of mouth is another great one the vast majority of our stuff comes from word of mouth again because we always do what we say we're going to do we always transact if we say we'll do it um my personal preference is to be able to find stuff that you can add value to because at least that way you can do it to the standard that you want to do it which means less maintenance in the future and also you tend to be able to refinance your money back out of it using that buy refurbish refinance method um but once you've got a decent cash flow the cash flow builds up and if you don't spend it you can get a deposit that way and then all of a sudden you're organically growing your portfolio letters things like that you could send letters to landlords um you can put adverts on facebook you can put signs on your car you can put signs in the windows of the properties that you're doing um networking finding landlords that want to retire trying to you know get to know them genuinely not just because you know they want to retire because people can see through you it's so easy to see through people when they want something um and just be open to having relationships with people that have and you are happy to give rather than doing giving to receive if you if you are of a giving nature and you will help people genuinely then you will find that people want to do business with you if you offer something if you get something back that's a, a one way ticket to nowhere anyway that's just another one of my tips um try not to be completely reliant on the refinance to get all your money out so try and find deals that have got margin in because if the valuer comes out to put the mortgage on the property and they undervalue it or downvalue it um you will end up leaving more money in than you thought um not the end of the world the money isn't lost it's just stored within the property um but if you've got if you can find deals that you've got a little bit of play in then if you get the full value when it comes to refinance you might have a little extra that you can put into the next deal but if you get a slight down valuation it's not the end of the world and always have a, an exit in place so if if it doesn't work for whatever reason as a buy to let what other things can you do with that property can you flip it and sell it for a profit that's always the bank in the cash is always a good option um could you you know put get a social housing contract on it and and give it give put a lease on it to a social housing provider could you do it as it might not work as buy to let but it's a particular need for serviced accommodation in the area so have multiple exits for every property you get don't always bank on one particular thing um but there yeah, are not many mistakes at this with this strategy really because it's the lowest risk and it's the bottom of the investing pyramid but if you can get very good at it and you can do big volume tens 15 20 properties people will notice and if you're one of those people that looks to raise finance and you've got a track record of 15 20 even 100 buy to lets people will very quickly want to lend you money because they know that you've got a big asset bank behind you that secures their investment in you so plus I think something that most people don't really kind of appreciate is the more active you are, 
the more you get known to people, the more connections you make with tradesmen, with estate agents, with lenders, with trade accounts in various places, with builders, merchants. Activity creates opportunity. And so the more active you are doing stuff, even doing buy to let the more you get a reputation, the more word spreads and the more opportunity you will find comes to you. So I think that's one of the hidden beauties of buy to let at scale at the lower end of the investing pyramid that most people really don't appreciate because that has a value all of its own that it's very hard to quantify. And so there we go. That's my little walkthrough of the buy to let strategy. I hope you found some value in it. Hopefully there was a couple of things in there that you may not have appreciated from other content you've listened to or watched on buy to lets. But um, if you did enjoy it, if you found some benefit from it, then please put a little comment down there or press the like button. And if you got any value at all, then hit the subscribe for me as well, because I'm slowly trying to build this little YouTube channel up. It's not easy, but I'm having a go. Anyway, all for now. More next time. See you later.